to talk to you about some of the important things in our life as a Christian who live in 2024. 2024 is different than the past years. Why? Because the world is changing. People are worrying about uh, AI. Do you know what is AI is? Artificial intelligence. Yeah. You have no idea how many countries have already uh, made artificial intelligence things. Uh, it is just mind boggling to see they are. The ones that they are making these days are able to do thousand times better than what we are. If you are an artist, that one can do better than you thousand times. That's what I'm talking about. So people are worrying about it, but we don't have to worry about it. All we can do is just concentrate on the word of God because the word of God teaches what is expected in the future. And we know the word of God teaches what happened in the past and what is happening today and what will happen in the future. You cannot find that anywhere, other, any other book yeah. that people can call. You know, they can call scriptures. But I'm telling you, none compared to the word of God that we have. Hallelujah. That is why I believe Bible is the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. From coward to coward, it's more than enough for us. God has revealed to us all the things that we need to know. The secret things belongs to God. Man can try and find out a lot of things and calculate a lot of things. But still, it is almost like an ant trying to understand you. Right? Do you understand? The scientists of this world are like ants like trying to understand you. Ants don't understand you. Ants are so tiny and they are they, their way of life is different than you and me. And that is the same way. Man can do everything that can and try to analyze everything, but he cannot come even closer to God. Hallelujah says, my ways are higher than your ways. My Amen. thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so God, he has given us in his word, the secret things belongs to God. And the revealed things are for us and for our children, the word of God says. So we need to be well versed with the word of God. It helps us in our journey. I was reading, uh, you know, about John Bunyan. Anybody know John Bunyan? No. John Bunyan is the author of Pilgrim's Progress. The second after the Bible, John Bunyan's book, that is Pilgrim's Progress, has been printed in different kinds of languages. Even today, people are buying it and reading it. If you have not read it, you better get a copy of it and start reading. That's a wonderful book, John Bunyan's book. And to tell about John Bunyan, he was uh, born in 1628. That's about 400 years ago, praise the Lord. 1628. And he lived till 1688. That means he lived about 60 years. That's all. In those days, people lived, you know, a very short, limited time. But now, because of the advance of technology and medicine and everything, you know, we are increasing a little bit. But nobody is going to live forever, praise the Lord. So, so John Bunyan was a very common person, you know, born in England and a very simple family, from a simple family. His father was... Uh, uh, you know, working with uh, pots and pans. You know, in those days, if your pot has a hole, somebody will come along and fix it. How many of you remember that? You don't remember that? I remember that. I'm not that old either. <laughs> I remember in those days when you have a, a what do you call brass vessel, and you know it got a small little hole, and this guy comes along and go to house after house. To find and so he will work on it and you know have a thing to work on it and fix it for people that is what the job this John Bunyan's dad was doing so they were from a very poor family so as he was growing up in Anglican Church he was from Anglican Church he was regular to the services and everything but something happened he started seeing you know uh, horrible dreams you know so somehow uh, he got saved and uh, he wanted to preach. In those days, you, anybody cannot just preach. 
You have to be ordained by the church at that time. Church had complete control. And that is why people started coming from England all the way to America to find the freedom of religion, right? Religion was controlling. Uh, thank God that we are not under religious control. Praise the Lord. Amen. You and I have the freedom to worship the Lord in the way that we want. And so uh, John Bunyan's time, he was not allowed to preach. So he said, I'm going to preach because God saved me and set me free. So I'm going to go and preach. So he started preaching. And so they put him in prison. Do you know how many days he was in prison? He was there in prison for 12 years for preaching without permission. Today, we don't have that. Anybody can stand up and preach these days. Hallelujah. You can start your own Bible study in your home. You can just stand in the street corner and preach. You can preach anywhere that you want. You have the freedom. This country is known for religious freedom. But if you don't take it seriously and do it, and we will be losing that freedom that we have. So John Bunyan, when he was in prison for 12 years, he said, okay, I'm going to do something. So he started writing things. And one of the books that came out of his work when he was in prison, you know, and somebody is in prison, there must be a reason that God puts them there. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Paul was in prison. Whenever Paul was put in prison, he said, okay, it's time for me to start writing. And, you know, it's called prison episodes. He started writing to church after church after church when he was in prison. That is the same thing. John Bunyan did. Even though the church did not allow him to preach, you know what? I'm going to write something. So he wrote this beautiful book called Pilgrim's Progress. It is a, it is a massive big book, but it is just so interesting that if you start reading, you will understand, you know, there are a lot of things that John Bunyan is talking about. You know, he's coming from the Puritan background later. In that, he, when he was traveling, you know, and he faces very difficulties and then he passes, he comes to the cross and his burden rolled away. And then uh, he comes to, a, you know, continue to struggle to through his journey all the way. Uh, but in spite of this individual journey and the faithful is a person called faithful would join with him in his travel. So what I'm trying to say is that you cannot make it in your Christian life by yourself. Jesus, that is why Jesus sent people, disciples, two by two. He says, don't go by yourself. I want you to couple with somebody else and just go together so that if one person is weak, the other person will be able to help that person. So two by two, Jesus sent them all everywhere. They went town up to town and preaching the gospel and bringing people to the Lord. So what I'm trying to say is that we need each other. We need to grow together so that we can study the word of God together and stand tall together. There is power in oneness. Praise the Lord. When people's mind and heart and spirit just unites together, you know, forgetting about all our differences that we can, we have a lot of strength when we come together in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm so proud of all of you that chose to be in the house of God this morning. So turn with me in your Bible to Paul's letter, the second letter to Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor that Paul ministered and, uh, you know, helped. And, and he grew up. And so this, this is called the pastoral episodes. So in the second Timothy, I'm going to read a few verses and we'll just uh, go on. Uh, if you have read this First Timothy and Second Timothy, you will be able to understand the heart of Paul. Paul had a great compassion and concern for the ministers, for the young ministers. He wanted to encourage them and uh, direct them in the right path. You know, we need people to disciple people. What Paul was doing to Timothy is that he was discipling Timothy so that that Timothy can disciple somebody else. So in the second uh, chapter, second Timothy chapter two, if you read verse one onwards, he is advising the young uh, Timothy. He said, you then my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
And verse 2, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, what Paul is writing to Timothy is that you have heard me say things. You know, Paul was always a very talkative person. Wherever he go, he continued to talk about the Lord and he, he teaches people. And so he is now boldly saying, Timothy, young man, you heard me say things. The witnessing things that I have done, not only for you, but for everyone that I have ministered to you, heard everything, and I want you to hold on to it. And not only you hold on to it, but I want you to take it and interest into people who that you can trust. Reliable people. Don't just throw it on everywhere. Just make sure that there are reliable people who can be faithful to God and you impart in their life. That is what discipleship is all about. What did Jesus do? That is what exactly Jesus did. He gathered some young men and just called them, okay, I want you to be with me. Discipling them takes time. Discipling them takes energy. But Jesus did it. He called them and he had them with Jesus. Everywhere he went, he had all these disciples with them. Why? Because Jesus was discipling them. He was teaching them so that in later times, that disciples will be able to teach others. Did they do it? Yes. Did they fail? Yes. There are times that when, when Jesus was arrested, how many of you think that any disciples stayed with Jesus? No. no. All of them ran away. Even after listening to Jesus and seeing the miracles and everything, but they were not able to stay when the temptation, when the trial comes. But Jesus prayed for them. He said to Peter, Peter, the devil wanted to just shift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. When you repent, when you come back, I want you to encourage your brothers. So that is what discipleship is all about. Somebody ministered to me, discipled me, and I have a responsibility to entrust that to somebody who is reliable. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it is so difficult to find people who are reliable that you can entrust into their life. Trust, you know, whatever that you have into their life. So Paul gladly found Silas and Titus and Timothy and all these young men. And he imported in their lives because he thought they are reliable people. And he told Timothy, son, I want you to not forget whatever you learned from me. But I want you to also entrust into somebody else. You and I. All of us have a responsibility to disciple somebody. If you have sons and daughters, then you have a responsibility to disciple them. That's what Ruby and I did. They have to be there in the church. Praise the Lord, whether they like it or not, because I'm the pastor. Hallelujah. And when a man was just lying down in the bed, you know, Sunday morning, and the mother came and said, son, you need to go to get up and go to church. And he said, tell me one good reason that I have to go to church. She said, because you're the pastor. <laughs> right? So we had to learn to disciple, first of all, our own children. If you have grandchildren, you have a responsibility to disciple them. If you have your neighbors and your friends, they are not just your friends. They are your disciples. You have to make sure that you are imparting in their life what God has given you in your life. Amen. If Paul did not choose to impart in Timothy and Titus and Silas and all these young men, and they will be doing their own thing. But now that Paul can boldly say that you have heard from me and I want to give you this responsibility of discipling somebody else. Praise the Lord. There is so many advice that Paul, the Apostle Paul has given in his writing to Timothy. Let me take you to some of the uh, passages that we have here. All right. He said it is important uh, in look at verse uh, 14. He says, 
Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruin those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. He is just giving advice to uh, young Timothy. He said, young man, I want you to grow in the Lord. Not only grow in the Lord, but be aware of what to do and what not to do. Don't get into argument with anybody unnecessarily. Because the more you argue, the more you are driving that person away. Amen. Argument will never win anybody. Praise the Lord. So don't argue with people. But tell them with the love of the Lord about who Jesus and what he has done for you in your life. Now let's go further to chapter 3. He gives some more information. He says, but mark this in verse 1. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. He says, now you be careful because things are changing. Paul says things are going to change in the last days. When he talked about it, he talked about the next generation. He said, Paul is going to be, you know, killed. How many of you know that? Paul is going to be arrested. Paul is going to be martyred. He, they are going to cut his head off because of the preaching of the word. But the next generation will go on. That is how the word of God begin to spread out everywhere. The early church spread the gospel of Jesus everywhere. Do you know why? Because they understood the importance of taking the gospel that they have received and imparting in somebody else's life. And that is why I'm so proud of all the ministers who are ministering in churches. I am so proud of all the missionaries who are called to go to different places. They are so bold in going to places that you and I will never dare to go. But they are called to go. Why do they go? They go so that they can find somebody to interest what God has done in their life. To change lives. To minister to people. To, to disciple people. So you and I have a responsibility not only grow ourselves in our spiritual life. But also find somebody that you can impart what God has done in your life. There was one time I can give you one example. You know, When I was a young boy. Uh, I was uh, the first year of my ministry in uh, with the Assemblies of God in India. I was teaching in a Bible college as well as I was pastoring two churches. And uh, while I was doing that, one young man showed up one day in my house and knocked at the door and said, uh, Pastor, uh, would you please take time to teach music for me, guitar? I said, uh, I don't have time. I'm teaching in the Bible college and I have to take care of as a chaplain for this industrial school and I have to you know, prepare for my service in the two churches that I'm preaching. I have to do my Bible study. But then I realized that, you know, this is my job to encourage somebody. You will never know what God can do. So this young man, I said, okay, I will take a little time and teach you this guitar. And so he learned it so carefully. I wrote down these chords and everything, and I taught him the thing that he needs to know. And, and he rides his bicycle more than six miles to come to study from me. And I thought, okay. So I just taught him for a few months, right? And I have not seen him afterwards. You know, I moved to America and things changed. And one time I was traveling back to India. I was in uh, London. Uh, Heathrow Airport in London. I was standing to change, you know, from one uh, terminal to other, and I was standing in the line. There was a big boy standing behind me, and, and he just touched me like this. I turned around. He said, how are you doing? He said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> he 
said, you don't remember me, Pastor? I don't know. I don't remember you. He said, I'm the one that you taught music. This is this has been like 10 years or something gone, you know, this boy who was a young boy grown to be taller than me and, and he moved to London and he was doing all this, you know, uh, IT job and everything. But he told me this, he said, nice to see you. I want, always wanted to see you and thank you for what you did to me. It was just a few classes that I did for him, carelessly sometimes. But he learned it so carefully. You know what God did? He trained him to play music, and the guitar and everything, and learn to sing songs. And now he was, he said, God is using me in my church to do the worship. Oh, in London. Wow. Thank you, I said, wow. <laughs> you will never know what God can do through somebody. Even for Billy Graham, when he was sitting in a Sunday school class, there was a Sunday school teacher making a difference in that young boy, Billy Graham. Billy Graham did not turn to be Billy Graham in one day, right? Somebody important in his life discipled him. All, all of us have boldly can say that somebody has put in, involved in my life and imparted in me that I have been discipled. That is why. I'm telling you, it is your responsibility also to take time to impart and make disciples. Jesus said that main duty of these disciples was that all authority in Matthew's Gospel chapter 28, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So I want you to go into all the world and what? Preach the Gospel. And what? and then make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He was talking about Jesus is going to be there with us. Hallelujah. Jesus is with us. Hallelujah. Sometimes we forget about it. He said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. The moment you have accepted Jesus, he has come into our life. He washed all our sins away. He has given a new life. Look at the word of God. Every word of God just connects us to understand that you and I are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And we depend on him. We have to grow in him. We have to understand his presence in our life and have the responsibility to minister to others, starting with your own family members. I encourage you to be good to them and change, let them change by your behavior. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot impart in somebody else's life unless you have a light in you. A dead candle cannot light another candle. If a candle needs to light another candle, that first candle have to have what? Light. That light. That is what you and I have. We know that we have the light of God in us. But if we, we cannot just hover our, over our own light and cover ourselves. We have to open up and be a person who can disciple others. Love others. Minister to others. Be bold in these last days. There are people who are hungry and thirsty for God. Do you know that? There are young men and women are seeking because they are so lost with the condition of this world. So you and I can learn from Paul and the advice that Paul has given to Timothy. He's, there are several things that he said. Let me take you to some uh, verses here. It says, in chapter 2, if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse 22. His advice to this young man is this. He said, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Amen. Let me explain to you what Paul is writing to this young man. He said, Timothy, you are a young man. You may have temptations. 
But I want you to make sure that when you are tempted with evil desires of your youth, I want you to make sure that you are fleeing from that situation. Hallelujah. What did Joseph do in the Old Testament? When Potiphar's wife, when uh, Potiphar was not home, the wife said, okay, this young man, Joseph, looks handsome and nice. Let me just seduce him, right? What did Joseph do? Even though he was in charge of the whole household of Potiphar, he said, no, 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 no. God is watching me. He was running for his life. Bible says he left his outer garment and ran for his life. Don't just hang in there when the temptation comes. Don't think that you are strong enough to maintain the temptation that we are not. If Jesus had to use the word of God to come against the temptation that the devil brought, then how much we have to be strong. And the advice that Timothy gave, uh, Paul gave to Timothy was, young man, I want you to flee. Just run for your life. Praise the Lord. Another advice he said this in the next verse. Not only I want you to flee from the youthful uh, evil desires, but I want you to go after or pursue. I want you to, to seek after what? Seek after righteousness and faith and love and peace. There are four things that Paul lists here. Why? Because these are the things you cannot, no one can claim that I have accomplished it. He says, I have accomplished to be a perfect righteous man. Anybody here who is righteous? Will you please raise your hand? <laughs> right here. You cannot accomplish 100% of righteousness by doing anything, right? You have to pursue. You have to go after. You have to go after righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is doing the right thing. That's all it is. Praise the Lord. Doing the right thing before the Lord. And we have to pursue it. That means we have to go after it day after day. Lord, I want to grow in my righteousness. Bible teaches about it. How to do it. Not only in our righteousness we have to pursue. He said, I want you to pursue what? What is the next one? What's that? Faith. faith. How many of you can say I have 100% faith? Sometimes our faith is so low. <laughs> we question everything. We doubt everything. You know why? We are bombarded by all these ideologies all around us. Amen. And we are bombarded by all the people who believe these kind of ideologies. And so our faith can easily shake. But Paul says to Timothy, son, I want you to pursue after faith. How to pursue after faith? It says faith comes by hearing, hearing, hearing the Word, word of God. That, in other words, that I want you to sold out for the word of God. I want you to just rely on God and his word so that you can grow in faith. Pursue after faith. Not only pursue after faith and then what? Pursue after love. How many of you are perfect in your love? Right? I have not attained it. You have not attained it. Right? We are all trying to pursue. Paul says to this young man, Young man, I want you to keep your mind set on pursuing. You know, America is known for pursuit of happiness. Happiness, right? All right, you work hard and you make some money and you build, you buy a house. And then you work so much hard and then you buy another house. And then you buy another car and then buy another, buy another truck and then buy this and buy that. And you put your money here, put your money there. You work so hard, you're so smart. And, and then what? Is that what pursue uh, happiness? <laughs> right? I have seen people pursue after this and just, you know, work so hard and then they get just whoa, like, <laughs> like a person in the, in the wheel, you know, just go round and round and round and round, you know. No. That is why Paul says, I don't want you to get into the world's system. I want you to Understand what God wants you to do. I want you to pursue after the righteousness. Why? Because Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. No one can say, because I believed in the Lord, I lost everything. Paul says, you know what? 
I have chosen to lose everything for the sake of Christ. Hallelujah. Yes. And that is why we have to understand the world's system is different than the system that God has for us. The word of God says, son, I want you to pursue after righteousness. I want you to pursue after faith. I want you to grow and pursue after love. How to love people, how to grow in your love. How can you grow? 100% in the love for others. And that is what we have to pursue after. Not only that, in the last he says, pursue after peace. Wow. You know, peace don't come easy. Peace in the family, peace in yourself, peace in the community, peace in the nation. Peace in the nations cannot come by itself. Do you know how many nations are fighting right now? As we speak, that the world is just in war. And you will hear of wars and the rumors of wars. Bible says and it is happening right now. And it is increasing. And you will see not only the increase of that. But you will also see the increase of lawlessness everywhere. Amen. Recently I saw something in New York City. That there is a, a few uh, illegal immigrants who came into this country. And, and uh, a cop is, you know, caught one person. And the others joining and, and attacking these two cops. You know, things are changing rapidly in this world we live in. That does not mean we have to fear and worry and get confused. But the word of God teaches we have to focus. Keep your eyes focused on the Lord. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have to pursue after. You know, I'm not belittling Thomas Jefferson. Right? Thomas Jefferson in 1700s, you know, he, he started writing this, this beautiful declaration of independence and wrote that, you know, pursue, have pursuit of happiness. You know, it's a good understanding, you know, everybody work hard and, and live a good life. That is good and well. But what about your spiritual life, which is more important than anything else? Praise the Lord. If a man can acquire everything else and loses his own soul, what is it good for? Nothing. It worth nothing. So we have to make sure that not only we grow and pursue after the righteousness God desires us to have, the peace, the love, and the faith that it is important for us to continue to grow. And we can never attain it completely as long as we live. Paul says that I have fought a good fight. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he didn't stop there. He said, I have fought a good fight. And then what? I continue to fight. Every moment I know God has set a, a time for me. And when I attain that, and he will give me a crown of righteousness. Hallelujah. So there is something that we can attain as we pursue after. So Paul is encouraging this young man to keep your eyes focused on the things of God. Praise the Lord. If you want to know, look, learn more a little bit, a little bit here in the Second Timothy itself, you know, not only you have to flee your youth, youthful desires, evil desires, but you also have to pursue after these good things. And then, if you look at chapter four of Second Timothy, and he says something in verse two, Second Timothy chapter four, verse two, it says, "In the presence of God and of Christ." who will judge the living and the dead and view of his appearing of his kingdom. I give you this charge. Now Paul is giving this charge. He says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Mm. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, 
Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. What Paul is trying to tell these young men is, Son, I want you to preach the word. Hallelujah. What a privilege. There is no greater job in this world than standing up and preaching the word of God to others. Hallelujah. Do you know that? You and I have. You don't have to stand up in the pulpit to preach. You can preach in the restaurants. Hallelujah. You can preach wherever that you want. Wherever you have people that you can come in contact with. You can always share the word of God. The gospel with others. Why? Because Paul says the gospel is the power of God. And to people's salvation. He says I am not ashamed of the gospel. Amen. They beat him. Paul says, that's okay. I'll go to the next town. <laughs> and he will still preach the gospel. And even there, they will throw stones at him. And then he will say, what? That's okay. He will go to the next town to preach the gospel. Why? Because Paul says, it is the power of God and to salvation for some people who are lost in it. Church, as long as we breathe and live on this planet Earth, we have a responsibility to somehow work with the Lord and the Holy Spirit to build his kingdom. Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Hallelujah. How boldly Jesus depended on each and every one of us to stand up for him and be a witness for the Lord in these last days. That's right. Preach the word. In season and out of season. Praise the Lord. Be like John Bunyan. He said, I don't have a certificate, but I'm going to preach. Oh, if you're going to preach, Charles II said, okay, get him and put him in prison. Let's see where he is going to preach. <laughs> oh, you're putting me in prison? That's okay. I'm going to sit and write the greatest novel that is available and I'm going to write it in such a way it will be public. You know, he didn't make any money out of his work. John Bunyan never sold a book, but he wrote the book. But after him, when that book was published and a lot of people made money out of it, his book, he made no penny out of it. Do you think Paul, when he was writing all these letters, he made money out of it? No. We do it unto the Lord. We serve the Lord in any capacity. If God has given you different kinds of gifts and make use of it. You know, we never know what God can do. Tiny little teaching for these young men, uh, tiny little chords of a guitar. If God can use that kind. That's why Jesus said, you will not go without being rewarded if you give a cup of water to this child. God is a God who will reward for everything that we do. Praise the Lord. Don't ever think that your, whatever you are doing is going to go waste. Nothing is hidden from God. Praise the Lord. Our good things and our bad things, he knows it. Even before a thought comes to your mind, he knows it already. You cannot hide it from God. You can hide it from me, but you cannot hide it from God. Hallelujah. He knows everything about you. So what is the best way is to repent before God and say, God, just please help me to understand the gift that you have given me. And somehow I want to be used of you. If John Bunyan can't write down that pilgrim's progress, which ministered to so many people, all these 400 years. Do you know 400 years passed by? Before America became America, John Bunyan's book was out there. Praise the Lord. This is 1600 I'm talking about. Only 1700 we started coming in here. Mayflower started coming like, you know, just slowly from England, uh, England to America. And then Nina Pinta, Santa Maria, and all these ships was coming slowly and everywhere. But John Bunyan already has wrote down this book when he was in prison. Don't ever think that you cannot be used of God. God is looking for people that he wants to entrust. Reliable people. Are you reliable for God to interest in you and make use of you? Can God rely on you? He said, God, 
I'm giving myself to you. Whatever that you want me to do for your glory, I will do it. You can even write a small little, you know, uh, tract. You can write a small little song. Every song in the hymn book, somebody sat down and wrote it. Some of the songs that the hymn writers have written, they don't even know that their songs are going to be famous. Praise the Lord. Think about it that way, right? There are some hymns, amazing hymns, that ministered to all of us in 2024. Years together, somebody was willing to write it. Somebody was willing to put music to it. And you and I are worshiping the Lord with it. I love this song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust his sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. If I ask you a personal question, what kind of a gift that God has given you and what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? It can be anything. God can make use of it. It reminds me of this young man, this boy. 5,000 people gathered there, and Jesus asked the disciples, I see these people are so hungry, and they've been here with us for three days, and I want to feed them. Okay, can I do something to feed these people? Said, what can I do? We don't have that kind of money, Jesus. We cannot, you know, we cannot do that. Where can we go and buy this bread for all these people? And here comes one disciple and said, uh, here's a young boy, uh, but he has just five bread and two fish that the lunch that mom Made. backed up for him and, and he is willing to share. Jesus said, okay, get it. Five bread, two dried fish is feeding 5,000 people. Can God do it? Yes, he can. The willingness is what God desires in our lives. You don't have to have a certificate. Now, I've, I've, I've got my doctorate, okay? I'm Reverend Dr. J. I'll, you know, people I don't want. I do it. I study it for the benefit of me knowing things. Praise the Lord. You, as long as you live, you keep your mind sharp and, you know, try to understand and know things. It's good for you. But it's not, ministry is not depending on that. Ministry is depending on our willingness to serve God. Our, our willingness to humble ourselves and serve God. Amen. Praise the Lord. That is why Jesus went to this, this uh, uh, hometown of Capernaum and all these little towns. And Jesus chose all these disciples who are just simple people. They depend on whatever they catch that day. Fishing business. Jesus said, okay, Peter, James, John, uh, guys, just come follow me. They left their net and followed Jesus. Bible says. Jesus can use anyone and anything if he wants to. Hallelujah. Nothing is impossible with God. All through the Bible, you can see that it's not about who you are. It is about how much you are willing to yield yourselves for God. You can make an impact in somebody else's life that I cannot. Jesus is about building his kingdom. I'm taking 40 minutes now. <laughs> Because I'm just pouring out my heart. Praise the Lord. Amen. Is it okay to hear? Yes. Because I don't want to preach another sermon just like, you know, points and stuff. I just wanted to tell you exactly what God is doing in my life. I want God to use me and I want you to be used of God. That is what Paul's desire for Timothy. Young man, I want you to entrust into reliable people so that they can in turn minister to somebody. That is how Jesus wants to build his kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. He impacts us and we impact somebody else. Amen. Would you bow this morning? Amen. We are in 